the comprehensive thematic review protocol. Um, if I can just ask that all questions uh, remain to the very end and Solange and myself will try addressing them as best as we can. Um, alternatively, you can also um, type through any questions and we'll address them at the very end. Okay, so to get started, um, those that joined us the last time um, would remember that Taryn Young um, went over um, steps of a Cochrane systematic review um, where she um, discussed defining the question, um, which consisted of um, the PICO, so your population intervention, um, your comparators, and your outcomes. She um, spoke quite um, quite in depth about that and about having um, the difference between having broad and narrow questions. She also I went on to discuss registering the title and um, motivation for doing a systematic review. So uh, once your title is registered, the first part of the review process is to write protocol. The protocol includes two important components, which is planning the eligibility criteria for the review, that is which studies will be included and excluded, and planning out the methods um, that you would, um, or the methods we plan to use throughout the review process. Um, the protocols for Cochrane um, reviews are published in the Cochrane Library before we proceed with the review. And a protocol is there to plan the review and guide you along the way. Um, in the session, we'll cover points two to eight um, and talk more in depth about them. So just to go over some of the learning objectives that we would want to achieve by the end of this session, um, we'd want to list the steps of a system, systematic review process, including additional steps um, for Cochrane or that Cochrane requires, revise the importance of the PICO and defining a review question using PICO methods. Um, that, that's basically what Taryn went over in more depth, so I'll touch on that. And then the next step is revise the importance of defining criteria for considering studies for the review and outline the process of writing a protocol, including writing a clear comprehensive rationale for the review. So rationale for protocols. Um, systematic reviews basically involve judgments. Um, they are a retrospective piece of research. The results of the studies we include in the review are in theory already available when we start um, to plan. As we make our decisions about the review methods, the, the focus of our questions, the eligibility criteria for the reviews, the outcomes we plan to report. Um, it is important that we are not making decisions based on the known results of existing studies. It's important that we don't introduce bias to the review process and risk presenting an inaccurate or biased picture of the evidence. So one of the ways we try to address this is to plan and document our methods for the review in, in advance. Before um, before we've looked at the included studies and to make them publicly available, um, published in the Cochrane Library, uh, so that others can see what we are planning to do and hold us accountable if we make changes along the way that might have been influenced inappropriately. This also increases the transparency of the methods we're using and as an added benefit, Cochrane protocols are peer reviewed at this stage so that authors receive feedback on their planned methods at an early stage when it's um, easy to still implement changes rather than waiting until the whole review is complete. Um, other benefits include reducing duplication. Others can see the details of the reviews in progress and won't start working on a similar um, piece of work or review topic uh, as authors this protocol and the protocol has the very practical benefit of helping you plan out the tasks of the resource and resources required for the review process and it makes sure you've um, you've written your protocol in detail and can anticipate any difficulties in advance so when starting your protocol it's so good to have an author team which should be decided on before actually commencing the review um, your author team would be made up of um, uh, people that have um, content knowledge methods knowledge of the um, particular review that you are doing um, authors must meet um, certain minimum criteria and declare that they have made a substantial contribution to the review 
the specific uh, contributions of each author is recorded or would be recorded in the contributions of the author's section of the protocol. Uh, others who have contributed to the view um, but who don't meet the criteria for authors should be noted in that acknowledgement section. And then authors should be listed in order of the contribution. So the first author is the one who contributed the most to the review and the last contributed the least. The author's um, institutional affiliations will be published in the protocol. So make sure that um, the details are correct and these are stored by the review group in our central database called Archie. Um, and this can also be updated Authors are usually individuals, but if you have a research group you'd like to list as an author, you can also do that. Uh, the next step is to identify a contact person. Um, so as well as listing all the authors, um, you will be asked to nominate a contact person. This person um, would be or take um, the chief responsibility of communicating with review groups and organizing the review team throughout the process. Uh, this person is usually an author, but does not also have to be. Once the protocol is complete, um, the contact person's details will be published with the protocol, becoming the contact author for any feedback on the protocol. And added benefit of taking on this role is that when the complete uh, review is published, the contact person will receive complimentary personal um, subscription to the Cochrane Library. So when writing your protocol, um, throughout the pro protocol, it's important that you write it in an accessible language. And remember that your audience may not be experts in this field. They may not be health professionals or researchers at all. So try and avoid technical jargon. The protocol is always written in the future tense. So for example, you'll, um, you'll say, we will do this or do that and use active voice. So we will search and rather than the literature will be searched. A crucial resource for your review is the Cochrane Style Guide. And um, the link is on the slide. And this guide is designed to make it easy to write and copy edit your review in line with our house style. And it's strongly recommended to, um, for it to be used. So going on to the background, once um, once the logistics have been sorted out, uh, you you then start with the background, and the background should be like the background of any other research paper. It should put the study in context of what we already know, and the questions we want to answer. The background um, would include a description of the condition. So if it's um, the biology, the diagnosis, prognosis, prevalence, or incidence, and also the impact on affected, the affected people or communities that um, are of interest. A description of the intervention in the context of standard or alternative interventions um, would also be, um, like I said, described. So for, for example, with drugs um, or um, pharmaceutical drugs, pharmacology, dosage, metabolism, selective effects and half-life duration interactions with other drugs would be described. Um, You'll also discuss how the intervention might work. So the um, theoretical reasons, empirical evidence to support reasoning and um, why it's important to do this review. So this is where you motivate why, why you would like to do it with a brief statement of the rationale. Um, and also noting that um, no other reviews would be addressing this topic or you haven't found any reviews that address this topic. So um, this is a study by Baker 2015, Community-Wide Interventions for Increasing Physical Activity, which is a Cochrane systematic review. And I'll be referring back to this particular study and um, using examples of this um, throughout the session. As you can see over here, it's a background. Um, they've provided a background, a description of the intervention and how the intervention might work. Um, it's briefly, briefly um, written um, and after this presentation um, you can search it by Google Scholar, it's um, accessible to everyone and um, you can read up on how they've actually, um, you know, set out their, their protocol. 
And quite interestingly, they've also referred back to a logic model, which um, you can also access afterwards. And this they've linked with, with um, the background. So the next step is the objectives. Um, once you've prepared the background, you will have a good idea about the important questions that need to be answered by this. The objectives really are the, are the questions you want to have answered. Generally, this is a framed in a single statement derived from your questions as stated in your review title. Um, if you have key additional outcomes, for example, you would want to explore the effects in specific participant groups or compare specific alternative interventions, you may state them here, but you should not try to outline all uh, planned analyses and explorations here. Um, there will be plenty of space in the method section to do this. So if you go back to that um, study that I referred to earlier, by Baker 2015, their primary research objective was to determine the effects of community-wide multi-strategic interventions upon community levels of physical activity. And then the secondary research objectives was to explore whether any effects of the intervention are different within and between populations and whether these differences form an um, equity gradient. So in the protocol under your method section, these are the different um, points or subheadings that you would want to address. Um, the method section is broken down into these number of sections and uh, we'll discuss each um, after this. So basically the method section is where we plan to set out in detail our plans for the review. As mentioned, this is um, designed to minimize bias in our decision making later on. And once we've, we've had the results of the included studies, um, it's also a very valuable way to plan out your task and how you can begin to allocate work within your team and as a delegate work and get a good idea of how long it, each part of the process may take. Also make sure to describe your plan methods in enough detail so that someone else could follow the steps and replicate them if they wanted to. Um, and it's, it's so just generally good practice because it will um, help you um, so remain accountable to yourself and complete your review. Uh, at every stage, we would also want you to make sure um, you're selecting the best possible methods to give um, reliable answer, answers for decision making. Um, a good resource is to consult the Cochrane Handbook. Um, it's a good guidance based, um, based on the latest methodological research. And you should also consult your review group that, that you approach as they may have guidance on preferred methods and they may even have a template for, um, for the text of your protocol for you to follow. And if not, um, you can look at some other examples of recently um, published protocols from your review group that you are interested in approaching. And then um, on a final note, always write your protocol as if you will find enough studies to give you all the information you need to conduct all the measurements and analyses. So under your eligibility criteria, as you can see, the, we have um, the, the PICO or parts of the PICO that um, Taryn had already described in, a, in our previous um, session. Um, just to make a note of that, at the end of this um, slide, at the end of these slides, there will be a link to her session. Um, certain study designs are more appropriate than others for answering particular questions and authors should also consider a priori what study designs are likely to provide reliable data and with which to address the objectives of the review. Um, generally, because Cochrane reviews address questions about the effects of healthcare, they focus primarily on randomized control trials. Uh, randomized control trials or randomization is the only way to prevent systematic differences between baseline characteristics of participants in different intervention groups in terms of both known and unknown confounders. Um, going on to the next slide. So when researching all the search methods for identification of studies, 
uh, Cochrane Review authors should also seek advice from the, the trial search coordinators um, on the sources um, to search. Um, and they will assist with designing a comprehensive search strategy. Alternatively, one would need to approach an information specialist or a librarian who has knowledge with searching various databases and designing search strategies um, to get a comprehensive um, their comprehensive input so that you can find um, accurate um, studies. The full search strategies for each database search will also need to be included in an appendix of the review. So all search strategies uh, should be saved and notes taken of the number of records retrieved for each database searched. So we'll talk more about this a bit later. Um, and then I've also um, listed some of the databases over there and Central is considered to be the one of the best um, single sources of reports of trials for inclusion in uh, Cochrane reviews. Um, and then one would also want to consider searching conference abstracts and other grey literature, which can be an important source of studies for inclusion in reviews. Um, also consider reference lists in other reviews, guidelines and included and excluded studies and other related articles um, should be searched for additional studies. If it should be made to identify unpublished studies, Ongoing trials should be identified and checked for possible inclusion in reviews on completion. And uh, trial registries and trial result registers are an important source of ongoing and unpublished trials. Okay, so the next step will be data collection and analysis. The titles and abstracts yielded from a search, from a search strategy will then be reviewed or should be reviewed by two review authors who are, will independently assess these studies for inclusion. So this would be decided on um, by the first author um, who they would want as a second author. And this method is used to ensure potential that potential eligible studies are not missed. And then again, the full texts that are obtained from screening the titles and abstracts um, that are meeting the inclusion criteria would be based on the title and abstracts only. Um, the full text will again be screened by two reviewers independently uh, using the same methods, like I said, um, when screening titles and abstracts. And if there is or where, where there is a persisting difference of opinion, a third reviewer um, or author will be asked to review the papers in question and a consensus will be reached between the three review authors. Um, prior to this, one could also discuss with um, the other independent reviewer, um, you know, the inclusion and exclusion of, of certain studies. And if one can't reach a consensus, then move to um, a third reviewer. And then when screening, it is also important to have an eligibility criteria form to ensure that studies meet the inclusion criteria. Um, this will prevent any confusion from occurring. And so record the information at every step. So in the next slide, I will show you an example of what is called a PRISMA diagram where authors recorded um, their steps. So as you can see over here, this is from the Baker 2015 study. Um, they, they found uh, 38,955 studies. And then on the right top um, box, they found an additional um, 516 studies. Um, well, yeah, 516 studies from other websites and then 69 um, looking at the other references. And then they recorded after duplicates were removed to our um, 27,089 studies. They then screened this. So this is where they screened the titles and abstracts, which was 17, well, sorry, 27,089. Um, 27, and um, the records they excluded were 26,820. And then from here, um, the full text articles that were assessed for eligibility were 269 and then the articles excluded were 235. So um, over here when they excluded the full text articles with reasons it would be either that 
the articles did not meet the well it would be that the articles did not meet the eligibility so maybe the populations were wrong or the intervention wasn't um the similar or the same intervention like what they were looking for or maybe even the study designs were not um, correct and then after this they included for the qualitative synthesis 53 studies and of which one is still ongoing or was ongoing at the time and the studies included for quantitative synthesis or for the meta-analysis was zero so it means that the studies were not uh, similar enough for them to to analyze okay so going on again um, further for on data collection and analysis data extraction and management um, data will be extracted for all those studies that meet the inclusion criteria using a data extraction form and this is uh, specially designed for your review examples of these are so easily found online or depending on the review group um, that you submit to um, they may also have um, again, to review, authors will independently complete the data extraction, and um, if there are any disagreements, um, the two review authors would either consult um, a third reviewer or um, discuss discuss it before that. Um, in addition, multiple reports and publications of the same studies or the same studies will be assembled and compared for completeness and possible contradictions. Um, data will be extracted from um, companion studies that report findings on the process evaluation of um, the intervention that you're interested in. And then results are usually recorded in RevMan 5 and um, a link to, to that particular software would be, will be at the end of the slide and you can also um, record your data in Excel. Um, and Redmond 5, you would use this um, program to analyze the data. And then if there are any, um, or if certain aspects of the study is unclear, then you can also contact the, auth um, the authors of the, of the paper or the study that you are assessing uh, to seek clarity on it. So usually the, the email addresses or some form of contact detail will be, will be um, in the publication. Okay, the next step is to discuss the assessment of risk of bias in the included studies. Um, this again will only be um, done for include for studies that meet the inclusion criteria and it is reported in a risk of bias table and this table can also be found on uh, Revman or in the Revman 5 software. Again, two review authors um, will assess this and it's basically the same principle if there are any um, disagreements, um, the two authors come together, they discuss it and decide um, on, on, um, on making a decision and if a decision can't be made, again, they go to a third review author and take it further. And then the studies will be assessed for five general domains. Um, for risk of bias, or sorry, not five domains, but various domains of risk of bias. So as you can see there, it's sequence generation, allocation concealment, blinding, incomplete outcome data, selective reporting bias, other sources of bias, and overall risk of bias. Um, I won't go into uh, um, detail or discuss them here, but um, this can easily be found on the Cochrane, in the Cochrane Handbook. And also in Revman um, 5, the software, um, if you go to the help option in there, um, you can type in risk of bias and it discusses each of these domains. And then for each study, um, when one looks at the, the domains, you will be assessing or answering whether it is yes, indicating a low risk of bias, no, indicating high risk of bias, or unclear, indicating either lack of information or uncertainty over potential um, bias that may occur or may have occurred. And these studies will be judged overall as either low, medium or high risk of bias um, given overall considerations of the study design and size and the potential impact and the identified weakness noted in the table of each study. Um, 
Also to note that the type of risk of bias tools used for your review depends on the type of study designs you decide to include. So for RCTs or randomized control trials, you would use Cochrane risk of bias tool. But for other studies, there are various other tools um, or other reviews um, that you might include or studies included in, uh, in your review. You, there might be different tools. So for example, there's also the Newcastle Ottawa scale, and there are numerous others as well that you can find online. Okay, and then this is just a screenshot of um, Revman of the program. Um, and then as you can see, uh, where it says Cochrane 2007, that's basically where the study name or ID would go. Um, and then you would, one would describe the methods, the participants, interventions, outcomes, and notes, any extra notes that you may want to include over there. And then after that, you have your risk of bias table with a drop down. As you can see on the drop down, it, it starts off with unclear, and you can either rate your judgment for bias as being yes, as high, or no, being low, or unclear. And then um, to motivate why you would. Uh, give a potential vote. You could maybe copy and paste um, part of the of the original text and put it under the description, or say where you found it um, to to help you remember. That's just a bit of a closer look of the risk of bias tool or table. And then also um, when starting, you will also consider your measurements of treatment effect. So the effect sizes for dichotomous outcomes will usually be expressed as relative risk um, in the first instance. And uh, yeah, the intervention group would be compared to the control group alongside the 95% confidence interval. And then for continuous data, uh, one would use the mean difference if the outcomes are measured in the same way between trials. So if um, similar tools, um, assessment tools are used. Or you would consider um, standardized mean differences to combine trials that measure the same outcome but use different methods. And then there are also unit of analysis issues, which is an important, an important principle in clinical trials is that the analysis must take into account the level at which randomization occurred. And most circumstances, the number of observations in the analysis should match the number of units that were randomized. Um, in a simple parallel group design for, for a clinical trial, participants are individually randomized to one of two intervention groups and a single measurement for each outcome from each participant is collected and analyzed. However, there are numerous vari variations on uh, this design, so um, authors should consider whether in each study uh, groups of individuals were randomized together to the same intervention, so whether they were classified, randomized cluster randomized trials or um, individuals that undergo more than one intervention. For example, in a cross, um, crossover trial or simultaneous treatment of multiple sites on each individual. And then there can also be multiple observations for the same outcome that can also occur. So example, repeated measure, measurements or, or recurring events. Um, and then a lot more detail, unit of analysis issues is quite, quite in depth, so um, can get quite in depth. So there are chapters nine and chapter 16 in the Cochrane handbook, which describes this um, in a lot more detail. And then there will also be instances with where one will have to deal with missing data. So strategies for dealing with missing data should be described um, in your protocol, and this will principally include missing participants um, due to dropout. So that's what missing data um, includes. And whether an intention to treat analysis will, will be conducted. That's also um, something that that um, has to be um, used in your in your analysis. Um, so for included studies, one needs to note the levels of attrition and explore the impact of including studies with high levels of missing data in the overall assessment of treatment effect by using a sensitivity analysis. Uh, for all outcomes that one carries out an analysis on as far as possible, 
Um, one wants to do it on an intention to treat basis. So you attempt to include all participants randomized to each group in the analysis. And um, yeah, and then all participants will be analyzed in the group to which they were allocated and regardless of whether or not they received the allocated intervention. So that's something um, important that one needs to note. Um, and then also remember that one again can contact authors for missing data. So if there's um, study methods or participants that are lost to follow up outcome data, statistics that are unclear or missing, um, important to, to note that. And the next is to consider assessment of heterogeneity. Um, inevitably, studies brought together in a systematic review will differ, and any kind of variab variability among studies in a systematic review may be termed um, as heterogeneity. Um, it can be helpful to distinguish between different types of heterogeneity. So uh, variability in the participants, interventions, and outcomes studied may be described as um, clinical diversity, or clinical heterogeneity, and then variability in study design and risk of bias may, de may be described as uh, methodological heterogeneity. Then there's also variability in the intervention effects being evaluated in the different studies, which is known as statistical heterogeneity. And this is a consequence of clinical or methodolo methodological diversity, or it can be from both amongst the studies. Um, statistical heterogeneity usually manifests um, itself in the observed intervention effects um, being more different from each other than one would expect due to random error or chance alone. Um, and then heterogeneity will be assessed through examination of um, forest plots and quantified using an I squared statistic. And the I squared statistic is a useful statistic for quantifying the inconsistency. Um, the amount of heterogeneity is quantified and evaluated to determine whether observed variations, like I said, in the study results is compatible with variation expected to try and to learn. Um, yeah. And then the next will be the assessment of reporting biases. So this is to assess whether smaller studies were potentially missed um, in a systematic review where there are more than 10 or 10 or more studies in the meta-analysis, one would investigate reporting bias, um, such as publication bias using a funnel, using funnel plots. Um, if one searches for other systematic reviews or Cochrane systematic reviews, um, one, one would probably find um, funnel plots, but in the particular example that I was using, they never had enough in order for me to um, present an example for this. Um, one can investigate the risk of publication bias by intervention type and outcome measure. Um, so one would assess the final plots um, for asymmetry visually um, and the studies with at least 10 studies, one will conduct statistical tests of asymmetry um, using either or using the Biggs and Eggers uh, test. Um, under data synthesis, the choice of meta-analysis methods um, should be stated. So one wants to um, state whether one would be using either fixed effects or random effects model. Um, and if a meta-analysis is undertaken, a systematic approach to synthesizing the findings of multiple studies uh, should be described here. So one uses fixed effects method, uh, fixed effect meta-analysis for combining data where it is reasonable to assume that the studies are estimating the same underlying treatment effect. So that is where trials are examining the same intervention and the child's um, populations and methods are judged uh, to be sufficiently similar. If, if there's clinical heterogeneity, which is sufficient to expect that the underlying treatment effects differ between in trials, or if substantial statistical heterogeneity is detected, one would use the random effect meta-analysis to produce an overall summary if an average treatment effect across trials is considered clinically meaningful. And then if the heterogeneity is too high, then no meta-analysis, um, and, and it, it looks like no meta-analysis um, should or could be performed, 
then um, one wouldn't obviously be able to pull the data, which means a narrative synthesis would need to be conducted instead. And then in your protocol, one would also please specify your subgroup analyses. So year one compares the effects of interventions across um, certain groups. Uh, in the example that I refer back to, they were um, comparing the effects of the, of the interventions um, among um, groups such as so, um, social groups, cultural, health status characteristics, um, ages, gender, ethnicity, um, level of income. And then there are also um, more, more groups that one could use depending on the type of study or the study that you are using. Um, and various um, reviews would have various uh, subgroups that they would want to include. Um, this would be used where sufficient data is available, are available um, for, for one to perform additional um, subgroup analysis. And then assessing the certainty of the evidence. In order to assess the overall certainty of the evidence, um, um, of the evidence of assessed from comparisons, we will also um, use GRADE, which is um, the grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation system. So GRADE is a transparent framework for developing and presenting summaries of evidence, and it provides a systematic approach for making clinical practice recommendations. Um, as you can see, there are five domains, which is risk of bias, imprecision, inconsistency, indirectness, and publication bias. And if one goes to the GRADE website, and if you had to copy and paste um, point number two, basically, into Google, they will um, explain in detail each of those domains and how they would be assessed. Um, from this, one can then also prepare a summary of findings table for all primary outcomes for the relevant comparisons um, under each intervention category. Um, and basically, a summary of findings table is an optional, although strongly recommended, means of presenting findings for the most important outcomes, whether or not the evidence is available um, um, to you or not. And then the summary of findings table also includes, where appropriate, um, the summary of the amount of evidence, typically absolute risk um, risks for people receiving an experiment and control interventions and estimates of relative effect, example, risk ratios or odds ratios. Um, and it's a depiction of quality of the body of evidence. Um, it consists of comments and footnotes and assessment of the quality of the body of the, of the evidence should follow the grade framework, which combines considerations of risk of bias um imprecision inconsistency indirectness and publication bias and just to let you know that grade um grade on itself can be a lecture on itself so um again my um, best advice would be to go to the go um, and find a systematic review and look at an example of how they would have graded it And then next is the sensitivity analysis, which is performed to examine whether decisions regarding the review methodology influences the results of the review. In other words, a sensitivity analysis is a repeat of the primary analysis or the meta-analysis. Um, just to give you an example, um, one may decide to reanalyze the data by excluding all studies from the analysis which were classified classified as high risk of bias and then reanalyze the results to assess whether those studies um, that, high risk, high, that had a high risk of bias differentially affected the results. And then um, under additional information, you would want to put your acknowledgements um, to recognize any additional contributors um, and the contributions of the authors. So declaring any um, or including any declarations of interests sources of support, and any additional tables and appendices. Um, and then that's just the screenshot of Revman again. And as you can see on the left 
this side. Um, under authors, that's how you would set out your author details. And then there are certain sections that are that are sort of blanked out, like your abstract and plain language summaries. So those would be things that would not be necessary or sections not necessary for the protocol. So everything that are that's um, bold or in black, that's those are the sections that you would require for your protocol. And then when your protocol is complete, check the details, um, check that the spelling and and um, and validation gets checked and so make sure that you have your Cochrane review group checklist um, and yeah expect internal and peer review from editors statistical editors peer referees um, consumers um, and like any journal it takes a couple of months and then this is basically um, just a snapshot of the um of the review that i was referring to or the protocol um as you can see there's a red um, box on the right side and, and under version history those would be the different versions of the particular review um, and under the very first one or the very first published one would usually be the protocol so if you want to look for an example of a Cochrane systematic review um, in the field of study that you're interested in um, do, do a, a simple search um, and look at the version you see and see how they've set out their protocol. But again, preferably look for something that was more recent. And this is just a summary of the learning objectives that we that we discussed today. And a take home message is um, that published protocols are a requirement for Cochrane systematic reviews and they are they are there to design or design to minimize bias write your protocol so that readers can understand in detail what you plan to do and follow standard structures available in revman it's a very good um, guide and source and then these are just some of the references that i was referring back to like the youtube video from professor taryn young um, of last of the last lecture and then there's also a link to revman and a link to um, the reviews and then acknowledgements um, to compile by Miranda Campston and it's based on material by the Australasian Cochrane Centre and approved by the Cochrane Methods Board. Thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions for Solange or myself, please go ahead. Thank you, Amir. Um, we have had a couple of questions while we were talking. Um, so one of the questions is from Lara Skinner, who asked about what is the difference between eligibility and inclusion criteria, if there is a difference. Um, and essentially, they are the same thing. Your eligibility criteria is essentially referring to your PICO. So who is your population, your intervention, your comparison, and your outcome, and what type of study design you are including in the review. And those would be the eligibility or inclusion criteria that would help you decide what studies get included in your review or not. Um, we also had a question from Ari on whether the last author is the senior author, and I would say yes, Ari, in Cochrane Reviews, the last author is usually the senior author, uh, and the rest of the authors would then be organized according to contributions. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourselves and ask the question, or you can type it in the text box. Hi, Solange. Hi, Ari. Now, did you see my next question or suggestion? Yeah, so Ari spoke about um, an Excel spreadsheet to help guide the review planning process. Um, so th this is to do with how you project manage your review. So there is an Excel spreadsheet, or you can set it up yourself. So it's a timeline with all the steps of your review uh, that you need to do as you conduct your review and try to plan for yourself as you would for a normal research project or when you plan to um, 
finish each step of the review. Um, I think anybody can draw that up, but it's a useful guide to have. Um, to guide um, a reviewer. Do you want to add to ask anything more, anything else about that, Ari? No, no, that was um, that's enough. Thank you. Um, and then I've got a, a message from Earl uh, about whether there will be a follow-up lecture or workshop in more detail. So this is just an hour, so it's very difficult to cover in detail how to do a protocol. And essentially, we've just touched on all of the items that you need to think about and consider when you're writing up your protocol. So all these items that Amir has gone through need to be in your protocol, and you need to describe how you're going to address these issues <coughs> and how you're going to conduct the review. Um, we are planning for a protocol development workshop later in the year, which will be a five-day workshop. Um, I mean, and that will be announced um, via all the relevant channels in the near future. Um, and you can sign up for that if you wish. Any other questions? There are a few comments I wanted to add if there, while I wait for other people to come with more questions. So I may refer to the, uh, the databases when we're planning the search strategy. Usually for a Cochrane review protocol, you will have your search strategy drafted for one, um, for one database, for example, for Medline with the help of an information specialist, hopefully, and that gets published with your protocol, and then you take that template of the search strategy and adapt it for all the other databases that you are going to be searching. Um, so that's something that's very crucial to do and to get right be as before you publish your protocol, because just drafting the search strategy uh, can be a major mission. Okay, Karen us send a message about um, the first session about defining the question avail being available somewhere. Uh, and this was uh, our previous webinar from April. We had a session on how to refine our questions, questions for systematic review, where we discussed in detail about PICO and the considerations on that. And I see Tamara has already shared in the chat box a link to our other webinars. So, that webinar on refining research questions for systematic reviews will be there on our website in the link that Tamara has shared. Another comment that I wanted to make was that um, Amir showed the PRISMA um, figure that outlines um, all the steps of study selection that an author has uh, gone through in order to identify the studies that are going to be included in the review. Um, and it's just important to note that while you have your, your eligibility criteria, and when you do your full text screening, uh, you need to take note of all the um, decisions you've made in terms of including and excluding studies so that in the end you can complete the PRISMA um, figure for, for your review. You will need to know exactly how many studies you found, how many studies you excluded at title and abstract stage, how many studies you excluded at full text screening stage, and at this stage, why did you exclude certain studies? You know, 10 studies were excluded because of wrong study design, five studies excluded because there weren't the right intervention, etc., etc. So you need to be able to trace back all your decisions regarding eligibility and why studies were included or excluded. Um, so that's just another note. Any other questions for us? If there are no questions, 
we will end the webinar. The, so the recording of the webinar will be on our website, and we will also share via email the slides of this presentation um, to everybody who attended. So thank you very much for joining us. And hope to see you again next month. All the sessions of our webinars are available um, on our website. So you can see all the sessions that are um, coming up for the rest of the year, which I should have up here now. But you can have a look at that. Thank you.